Oh. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So I don't need to record myself. Great. Good. Um, thank you, um, Rachel, for this introduction. Hello, everybody. Today, uh, I will go a little bit beyond my usual uh, field or area of expertise, um, as I will describe two experiments um, that we have been doing uh, with uh, two of my PhD students, uh, co-supervised by a number of people. We'll see that um, in a few seconds on uh, multimodality and uh, more specifically multimodal NLP. So as you probably know, natural language processing is generally monomodal. So most research in NLP deals with text data, um, but not all. And there is a lot of interesting research that is being uh, carried out as we speak on um, a number of uh, multimodal um, settings. Um, Multimodality indeed is not at all a homogeneous challenge. Um, there are a number of ways you can combine modalities with text and a, a number of different types of modality. Um, first of all, you have linguistic uh, modalities other than text, for instance, speech. Uh, that can be opposed to non-linguistic modalities, for instance, images, uh, fMRI data, and so on and so forth. And even for non-linguistic modalities, the nature of their relationship with uh, text, for instance, can uh, vary quite a bit. Um, for instance, the relationship between an image and its caption is not at all the same sort of relationship as the one between maybe the same image and the whole article, uh, news article, it is an illustration of. Another difference between several uh, multimodal settings is that some of the modalities are a function of time, uh, whereas others are still. Um, so a number of modalities I just cited, fMRI, speech, and so on, uh, obviously uh, vary uh, over time, whereas a fixed image is by definition still. On top of that, there are at least two ways uh, or two families of ways to combine modalities. This little zoom thing is a little bit annoying. It prevents me from reading my own slides, uh, but it's okay. Um, so one of the way you can combine two modalities is by developing cross-modal models uh, or tasks. So for instance, uh, transcription that consists in going from the speech modality to the text modality or captioning whereby you go from image to text. I don't know how to get rid of this thing. Oh, there is a masqué thing? Oh, no, le nom des annotateurs. Yay, thank you. Fantastic. This will go up, yeah. So the first way to combine modalities is indeed to, to go from one modality to the other, as in transcription, captioning, and so on and so forth. And a second type of way, uh, a second type of multimodal setting is when you want to try and use one modality to improve the processing of another modality. And this can be useful, for instance, to solve ambiguities. And uh, this will be illustrated today with image enhanced machine translation, or it can be used to extract information that is not available or not readily uh, available in the main modality. And this is, for instance, the case of the now a very uh, fashionable and well-known chat GPT plugins and, and things like that. I, I will mention them uh, in the conclusion. So this talk, uh, as I uh, said, will be uh, divided into two main parts. Um, it will focus on machine translation, um, but will focus first of all um, on two different modalities. One is speech, the other is image. And also it will um, illustrate the two scenarios I just mentioned, right? So going from one modality to the other on the one hand and using one modality to improve the, the processing of text uh, on the other hand. Um, it is research that is carried out uh, at Almanac at Inaria Paris, um, mostly by two uh, PhD students, uh, both of whom are uh, online today. So if uh, you have questions that I'm not able to answer myself, maybe they will be. 
able to do that. Um, so Paul Ambroise Duquesne for the first part of the talk, uh, who is a um, PhD student that I co-supervise with Holger Schwenk at Meta, and uh, Mathieu Futral, uh, who is uh, another PhD student, um, funded partly by Prairie, and whom I have the pleasure to co-supervise with three other Prairie chairs, namely uh, Rachel Borden here, Ivan Laptev and Cordelia Schmidt. Um, and yes, as I just said at the end of the talk, I, I will say a few words about this chat GPT things. So the first part of this talk will be dedicated to machine translation for text and speech. And uh, we will focus on multilingual and multimodal sentence embeddings. Um, it has been um, like customary in NLP over the, over the recent years to use uh, attention-based architecture to do natural language processing. But in fact, uh, attention-less architectures still have uh, something to do, um, some interest. Um, these models that are based on attention mechanisms, uh, often sequence-to-sequence -sequence architectures, often the transformer architecture, uh, require a lot of uh, labeled data, um, which if you want to do transcription or even worse, translation uh, is readily available for the text-to-text -text setting. Uh, we have tons of parallel data, but if you want to translate speech into text or even worse, speech into speech, then the amount of parallel data that will be available to you for training your uh, classical sequence-to-sequence -sequence models uh, is not really massive. Uh, this is especially the case for the speech-to-speech -speech setting uh, for which, as a result, end-to-end speech-to-speech systems are quite rare. Um, I oppose end-to-end speech-to-speech machine translation systems to uh, cascade-based uh, speech-to-speech machine translation systems, uh, which consists in first uh, transcribing the speech, then translating the transcription, so that's a text-to-text -text translation, and then generating speech from the uh, resulting translation. Um, of course, as you all know, uh, unsupervised representation learning is now uh, absolutely everywhere in NLP, and it can be used to initialize the encoder and or the decoder of the sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. Um, this indeed lowers the amount of labeled data needed to train or to fine-tune your model, and uh, a number of pre-trained models exist, uh, including multilingual one and multimodal one. So, for instance, I can mention XLM, uh, which is a text-only uh, pre-trained model trained on mask language modeling and translation uh, language modeling objectives. Um, Wave2Vec2, which is a speech-only pre-trained model. XLSR, another speech-only model. And finally, MSLAM, a speech and text uh, pre-trained model. Um, so these can be used, um, but there is another way. And this is what we are going to explore. The idea behind uh, text-to-speech and speech-to-speech -speech machine translation issues is that uh, there are two major challenges that you have to face when you want to do exactly that. One is the discrepancy between text and speech, especially in length. So the number of frames of, a, of the speech version of a sentence is much higher than the number of words or even indeed characters in the text version of the same sentence. And uh, as I said before, the availability of speech uh, parallel data is low, but there is quite a lot of monomodal, even cross-lingual on the one hand, and monolingual, even cross-modal on the other hand, data. So basically you can find uh, English text aligned with English, uh, with French text, and you can find English text aligned with English speech in large quantities. And you would like probably to take advantage of that. And the idea that we're going to explore here is to uh, rely on a fixed size intermediate representation of the input sentence, um, thereby embedding the input sentence in a sentence embedding space. And what we will get is an architecture that can be viewed as an, it's, well, that is an encoder decoder architecture, but without the attention mechanism, because we will just produce an intermediate representation and then use this intermediate representation as an input to the decoder and see what uh, happens. For that, we will be using the so-called laser uh, sentence embedding space. 
Um, so the idea behind laser that was developed by Holger Schwenk and colleagues since 2018 is to uh, train uh, sentence embedders that produce vector representations for sentences, uh, such that two uh, sentences with similar meanings will be embedded in the form of vectors that are close uh, to one another in the embedding space. And ideally, this should be the case even if the two sentences are in two different languages. So the idea here is that I love eating and I enjoy food a lot should be embedded in the same sort of place almost. Uh, but at that place as well uh, are the vectors embedding the German sentences ich esse gerne and ich genieße essen, which are almost uh, synonyms of, of the two English sentences. And this allows to do a number of things. Uh, if you stay, stay within the, the same language, you can extract paraphrases, for instance. Uh, and if you uh, go from one language to the other, if you compare vectors that embed sentences from multiple languages, this will allow you to actually extract uh, bytext, so parallel data. So firstly, how do you train uh, such uh, sentence embeddings? Well, what they did is that they used a by LSTM uh, encoder with a number of uh, of layers. Then they uh, use max pooling to produce just one vector representation of the whole sentence that is then provided to a decoder. And the decoder is trained to actually reproduce the uh, same text as the input if you are in auto encoding setting. But in fact, the model is trained uh, on parallel data. Uh, so text in a number of languages aligned with uh, English and Spanish data. And basically, uh, the model is trained as a multilingual uh, machine translation system. And because of this parallel data that is used during training, the sentence embedding space is indeed, to some extent, to some large extent, um, uh, language independence, which, is, which was the initial goal of the whole thing. And indeed, because you have this um, multilingual sentence embedding space uh, available, uh, you can then use that space to do mining, uh, parallel data mining. So basically, you you throw at your embedder a lot, a, a large number of sentences, and then you look for uh, sentence pairs that are embedded almost uh, at the same place uh, using cosine distance or L2 distance. And in fact, what they showed uh, works better is some sort of a, a margin uh, based distance. And they use this to extract uh, CC matrix from common crawl dumps. So large quantities of parallel data extracted from uh, the, basically uh, the internet. Um, and Wikimatrix, same thing, but from Wikipedia dumps. Uh, and using the fact that, again, if two sentences uh, have the same meaning, they will be embedded uh, almost exactly uh, with the same vector. and uh, Using that, you can find such sentence pairs, thereby creating parallel data. If you use this parallel data to then train classical machine translation systems, at least when the paper was published in 2020, the amount of data that they harvested in this way was uh, large enough to allow for improvement uh, over the state of the art in terms of blue, which is the traditional metrics in machine translation quality. The idea here is that you have so much more data, um, thanks to the mining process, that the maybe lower quality of the data, at least to some extent, uh, is less of a problem than the advantage that you get from the uh, increased volume. And then uh, what Paul Ambroise did, did before I was his uh, PhD supervisor, that was during his master's uh, thesis, uh, what, what he did with Holger is that he had the idea that maybe we could train speech embedders to uh, create speech sentence representations that uh, follow the same idea, so that the 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 um, the speech embedder would embed uh, the speech version of a sentence uh, as almost the same vector as the text embedder uh, embeds the, the the transcription. And to achieve this goal, what he did is he uh, trained. Uh, a speech embedder uh, using XLSR as a pre-trained uh, initialization. Uh, so with a convolutional uh, 
layers and then a transformer encoder. That's the architecture of XLSR. And then uh, minimize, minimize a cosine loss uh, so that the embedding of the speech version of the sentence and the embedding of the text version of the sentence, which is fixed using laser, uh, are as close as possible. So that's basically a teacher-student approach using laser uh, as a fixed encoder uh, as a teacher and uh, the speech encoder uh, being the student and being trained to mimic uh, the teacher uh, when provided with the same sentence, but obviously in speech form. And so, uh, as I said, new sentences are closed in the embedding space if they have similar meanings, not only independently of the language they are in, but also independently of whether they are in speech or in text form, which allows to extract uh, using the same uh, mining uh, strategy, large quantities of speech parallel data. Um, and so basically that's what was done and, and uh, in 2020, and we will be presenting this with uh, people from Meta at ACL. Uh, we mined uh, parallel speech data from the non-parallel part of the Vox Populi data set, which is basically European Parliament speech data, uh, 17 languages, um, like using a threshold of the similarity between vectors, uh, we were able to extract large amounts of data, of, of parallel speech data. And uh, what the people at Meta did is that they also took advantage of the availability of um, corpora, well, a corpus of Hokkien, which is a Sinitic language, which is generally not, not written, and which is available only in speech form, at least in the data set that uh, are available, uh, but aligned with Chinese, Chinese and English text uh, translations. And uh, throwing everything like this allowed them to uh, train speech to speech uh, models, uh, including a model, a speech to speech Hokkien to English model, which was then demonstrated and they were very proud of it. But that's the, the number of hours that uh, were extracted using this mining strategy. Um, and uh, it is uh, like, it constitutes quite, quite large uh, uh, parallel corpora. Uh, for the standards of the speech modality. And again, um, if you use uh, what we call speech metrics uh, to train speech to speech machine translation systems, basically you increase uh, the blue scores. Uh, so you improve the state of the art uh, above what was previously possible with the available um, speech parallel data, um, especially with a Vox Populi um, parallel Part, the, the parallel part of the Fox Populi corpus. Okay, so um, now that we have seen that we can embed speech and text in the same space and that we can use this embedding space for mining, both on the text modality and uh, more recently on the speech modality, we will uh, have a look at what we can do with this sentence embedding space in terms of uh, machine translation. So the first thing uh, that we wanted to double check is how does the original laser architecture perform in terms of um, autoencoding and translation? So you remember that uh, when, when laser was trained, it was trained with a relatively large stack of layers on the em uh, encoding side and the encoder side, but the decoder is actually quite simple. Um, and that was the intuition behind uh, what we did. So we observed that the uh, auto, uh, English autoencoding capabilities of the original uh, laser decoder was not that great, right? Autoencoding is basically you throw, uh, you, you give, you encode an English sentence, so text, an English text sentence using the encoder, you get your sentence representation and then you use the decoder to reproduce the exact same uh, sentence or ideally you get the exact same sentence. But in fact, as you can see on the left, especially if the sentence is a little bit long, uh, you do not get a particularly high blue score when evaluating uh, the output of the decoder with respect to the input of the encoder. And in English to German translation, the same phenomenon happens uh, whereby short sentences are actually correctly or like satisfyingly well translated, but as soon as the sentence is a little bit longer, it doesn't work anymore. And it was common, not common, common belief that uh, this was inevitable uh, because of the bottleneck of the sentence representation and the absence of attention. 
But in fact, what we did was to, to replace the uh, simple decoder by a 12 layer uh, transformer decoder, uh, not changing the encoder, not changing the sentence embedding space. And we got these results uh, much, much better, as you can see, especially in autoencoding, uh, but also in translation. And in particular, even though, of course, very short sentences are particularly well tr uh, translated, um, sentences up to 50 words uh, still are uh, quite well translated just by changing the decoder, which means that actually the sentence um, embedding space, the sentence representations, the, the, the sentence vector representations are really rich. They contain a lot more information that, than that what was previously thought. It's just that the decoder was too simple to actually extract this information correctly. So that was a first interesting thing. Uh, the second question was, is laser really optimally language independent? Uh, remember that two, se two sentences in two different languages that mean the same thing are supposed to be embedded in the same place. So the distance, the L2 distance between uh, these two vectors representing translations of the same sentence should be uh, very small. And indeed, it is quite small for languages that are relatively close to one another. So English to German, to French, to Spanish. But as soon as you go to Japanese or Turkish or even worse to Mongolian, then you can see that the language independence assumption is not necessarily uh, extraordinarily uh, confirmed. So we thought that we need to improve the language and the modality independence of the uh, embedders. So the first thing we, we did was to improve language independence of the embedders by training language specific encoders in yet again, a teacher student fashion. So basically we decided that the English embedder was the reference, the teacher, and we trained um, language specific encoders using an MSC loss uh, so that the translation, the German translation of a sentence becomes embedded closer and closer to how the English embedder embeds the English version of the text uh, of the sentence. And once we've done that, we can go uh, cross modal and we ask, so within the same language, we, we train a speech encoder, so which is now the student, uh, to mimic the behavior of the text encoder for the same language. So if that language is English, it's a teacher, uh, student, a standard teacher, student architecture. But if it's, if it's another language, then in fact, the student is the student of the previous student. So it's a second order student. A uh, student try, is trying to mimic uh, his teacher, who is in fact the former student of the main teacher, which is the uh, English encoder. And by doing all this, uh, we bring closer as before um, the um, sentence embedding of uh, an English sentence, of its German text translation, and of its English and German speech versions as well. Now, if we want to be truly multimodal, we don't need only speech encoders, we also need speech decoders, right, to be able to decode a sentence representation in, into some, into audio. Uh, and the way we, so what we did is we focused on training an English decoder, even if uh, training decoders for other languages uh, is not particularly, would not be particularly different. And the idea here is that we use uh, basically uh, an autoencoding architecture. So we, we train uh, a speech decoder to reproduce the so-called Hubert normalized discrete units representing the speech. So that's a basically I won't enter into details, but it's a discretized representation of audio signal that can then be uh, used as an input to, a, to what we call a vocoder that will indeed produce the, the speech itself, the, the, the signal itself. Um, and what's good here is that we don't need any uh, labeled data because we just take speech as an input, we encode it, and then we try to output to reproduce in an autoencoder setting uh, the, set, the Hubert units corresponding to the input. So in fact, now we have a joint space. So it's, it, of course, it's not absolutely perfect, but we have a joint space in which we can embed text in a number of languages, speech in a number of languages. And from that space, from a representation in that space, we can then decode uh, the representation into English text, into English speech, into German text, and so on and so forth. And so 
for instance, if you provide the dog is brown as an input in text form, we can just embed it and then use the, say, German text decoder and produce the Hund is brown uh, immediately in a completely modular fashion. So we don't need to have seen the combination English speech to German text in any training data ever uh, to be able to do that, because we just need to be able to, em to embed the input sentence and then to decode it in the language and modality that we want. And indeed, uh, in so what, what we found is that in text-to-text -text translation, uh, where we should be really penalized with uh, respect to the state of the art because we do not have an attention mechanism whereby the decoder can attend to uh, things uh, in the encoder, uh, we are not that bad. Uh, and as you can see, the, the scores that we get uh, with our zero-shot settings, um, only German English is not zero shot because we have used at some point uh, parallel German English data, but for all other uh, translation uh, language pairs, uh, this is zero shot. So we have not used any parallel data for these language pairs. We get results in terms of blue scores that are of course obviously below the state of the art of supervised machine translation, but not that uh, far below. And now if we move to speech to text machine translation, uh, that's where it becomes interesting because our zero shot uh, speech to text architectures are able to reach scores like the ones you can see here. So basically around 30 for more resource languages and around not a lot for the other ones. Uh, and this is to be compared with the previous first attempt at a zero shot uh, speech to text translation, which just failed. Uh, so it's zero everywhere or previous supervised uh, speech-to-text machine translation architectures, uh, which are not uh, um, not a lot better than our non-supervised zero-shot, uh, well, no, with our zero-shot architecture. Um, and this is now text-to-speech and speech-to-speech -speech results. Um, and as you can see, so on the left hand, you see our uh, results in uh, zero-shot text-to-speech and zero-shot speech-to-speech. And on the other hand, on, on the other side of the slide, you can see supervised uh, results train on, on, on data that is designed for this type of setting. And you can see that our results are in fact better, uh, at least in speech to speech. So maybe attention is not always what you need, or maybe you can do without it sometimes. And yes, this is uh, my transition slide. Uh, at some point, uh, we tried to uh, train another type of a decoder from that same space, which is a, an image decoder. It's a bit complicated. I'm not sure we will publish it or indeed have the model uh, finalized ever, but uh, the little puppy is cute and it is a good trans transition to the second part of my talk, um, which will be again about machine translation, but this time not cross-modal machine translation, but text-to-text -text machine translation, but helped by uh, image information. And that's what is called multimodal machine translation. So this is work, as I said before, done by uh, Mathieu Futral with uh, Cordelia, Ivan, Rachel, um, and myself. So uh, what does it mean to integrate visual context in machine translation, and why would we want to do that? Um, if you look at the slide on the left uh, with the caption, four bikers are racing on a course with a crowd in the background. And if you want to translate that caption into French, you want to translate it as quatre motards font une course, etc., and not quatre cyclistes, right? Um, and you need the image to know uh, whether these bikers are motards or cyclists. Same on the right. Too many in uniforms are playing football in the snow. If you don't know whether that comes from the from the UK or from the US, you will not know how to translate football. Uh, if you have the image, you know that it's football américain. So that's the, the the idea of disambiguation. That's one type of disambiguation uh, that image could do. Now, so uh, what type of visual features would you like to use um, to extract from images in order to improve machine translation? Um, you could uh, get global features, um, for instance, features from object recognition models. Um, you could extract bounding boxes from the images. 
you could try and, and extract specific parts of the image that are relevant to the translation. And this is the idea underlying an approach called GraphMMT that was published in 2020. Um, the authors use a pipeline that involves, first of all, parsing noun phrases in the caption, then detect bounding boxes for each of these noun phrases, and then use some sort of cross-model gating whereby the noun phrases in the text and the bounding boxes in the, in the image are uh, related to one another. In order to train such multimodal machine translation models, uh, well, you obviously need uh, multimodal parallel data. So you need uh, data that consists in uh, source sentences, target sentences, and associated images. And of course, you can use, as always in NLP and in computer vision in general, you can use pre-trained um, pre models. Um, and for instance, uh, you can pre-train on multimodal objectives, such as uh, visual mask language modeling, uh, which is basically mask language modeling with uh, vision uh, added to the, to the recipe. Now we have identified uh, we identified two main problems in existing uh, MMT, so multimodal machine translation approaches. The first one is that they rarely exploit text-only data, uh, and there is such there are such large quantities of text-only uh, parallel data that it is a pity not to be able to ex to exploit to take advantage of them in an MMT uh, model when training an MMT model. The second problem is that. It seems that in previous work, the gains uh, obtained uh, by MMT models um, by looking at the associated image were not due to interesting and, and relevant information being extracted from the image and then used to translate better, but was only due to regularization uh, properties. And this was shown by a number of people. Basically, what they uh, what they tried is to not translate a sentence using uh, with the help of the associated image, but to translate the same sentences with the help of randomly chosen images, and you basically get the same gains, uh, which shows that the information from the image is actually not used, and that uh, the information from the image only serves as a, a regularization uh, mechanism. So um, the way we are we attempted to uh, tackle these problems uh, is firstly. Uh, by starting from a pre-trained text-only uh, machine translation model and then find a way to adapt it to the multimodal setting so that we can uh, benefit from the large amounts of uh, text uh, parallel data that is available to pre-train this uh, um, starting point model. Um, and then uh, the second thing that we tried to do is to better exploit visual features. And for that, uh, we introduced two uh, specific things. One is guided self-attention, and the second is co-training between multimodal MT and visually conditioned uh, mask language modeling. And I will enter in, into the details now uh, quickly. So our model is called VGAMT. Um, it is an encoded, uh, encoded decoder model. Uh, in practice, it is a multilingual BART fine-tuned on parallel data. Uh, that's the starting point. So that's a strong, that's a basically almost like virtually state-of-the-art machine translation model. Uh, and then the idea is to add visual features uh, for of the extracted from the accompanying image. Um, and the key idea here is to use adapters uh, that are inserted between all the layers of our machine translation model and to then uh, pre-train the whole architecture without the adapters and then fine tune only the adapters once we take what once we start taking the uh, image based information into account um so which type of visual features do we use we use first of all clip features uh so clip features uh provide some features that are global to the whole image and we use also mdtr uh, features, which uh, MDTR is basically a model that is trained to associate uh, parts of a caption to bounding boxes of the corresponding um, image. And so what we do is we extract these two types of features and we provide them uh, as an additional input uh, next to the uh, text, next to the input sentence. Um, 
and again, so that part is inspired by the graph MMT uh, model that I mentioned earlier on. Um, the idea is to take advantage of the fact that MDTR uh, provides alignments between parts of the text and uh, bounding boxes in the image. Uh, and we can use this information to create um, a mask for the cross-modal attention so that not all words can attend to all parts of the image, but only those words that are related by MDTR to the, to, um, the specific bounding box will, will be able to attend that these uh, bounding box in the image. So basically, that's, that's an idea inspired by uh, graph MMT, but everything is extracted in a more systematic way thanks to uh, MDTR. And so uh, now that we know which type of visual uh, inputs we have uh, in the training step proper, um, we fine tune our model by just fine tuning the uh, adapter layers uh, using two different uh, uh, object, uh, objective functions, so two different objectives. One is multimodal machine translation, obviously. Um, so basically, we train the model to uh, provide the correct translation given the image in, as an input and the input text. And also visually conditioned mask language modeling. Uh, here, the idea is to not be cross-lingual, but to just uh, train the model to be able to fill um, masks while uh, staying within the same language. The idea is that this forces the adapters to actually have a look at the image and to not ignore uh, information from the image because uh, in this setting with this particular objective the model has no way to actually guess the right words uh, to fill the masks to replace the masks um, apart from looking at the image features okay so now we have our architecture we want to evaluate it um, can we do that um, the reference data set for multimodal machine translation is the multi 30k data set uh, in which each English sentence has an image associated to it and has a French, a German, and a Czech translation. Uh, the problem that we found in this data set is that via most sentences can be translated confidently without uh, having a look at the image. At least humans can do that, and there is no reason why a good machine translation system uh, model could not uh, do that as well. So only approximately 2% of these translations are indeed image dependent. Um, and this is not very satisfying um, because it shows that improvements um, over, over uh, like if you improve your scores over this data set, you don't necessarily know whether you did that for random reasons or regularization reasons, or because you, you significantly improved the translation of, this, of these 2%, right? They do not play a massive role. And so we decided to create our own data set, which is a data set of a different kind. It is a, contrasted, a contrastive data set. Our goal here is to know whether the, uh, our uh, multimodal machine translation system is indeed able to take advantage of the image information. And to do that, we designed a number of sentences, English sentences. So here in this example, we'll have to get rid of that mole. Uh, these sentences can have two different translations. Um, il va falloir enlever ce grain de beauté, or il va falloir se débarrasser de cette taupe. And the idea is to associate these examples with two images, uh, such that if the English sentence is associated with image one, only translation one is correct. And if the English uh, sentence is associated with the image number two, then only translation number two is correct. And then what we will, the way we will use uh, these examples, um, this is explained later. Yeah, so I, um, just to show you where these examples come from, um, basically we relied on a pre existing contrastive evaluation data set developed by Rachel during her PhD thesis that was meant to evaluate machine, the, the impact of the linguistic context of the previous sentence over the uh, quality of a uh, translation. So we took some of the examples from there, most of them, well, some of them from there. Um, we we paid attention to the fact that the images should be uh, freely available and so on and so forth. Um, and the first version of the corpus, the one which is uh, already published, has 50 ambiguous English words. So 50 English sentences, and then 100 of translations into um, 
French, German, and Czech. Why 100? Because as I said before, every single English sentence has two different translations in the other languages. Um, and so you see here again, uh, you have the same example with the translations in Czech. Obviously, if you use a machine translation system that is not uh, image aware, so a classical text only machine translation system, the English sentence will have only one translation. And obviously, it will be uh, probably the good translation for only one of these two uh, images, right? So if you ask the uh, your machine translation model to tell, to tell you which of the two translations is the best, if your machine translation model does not take image into account, it will always give you the same answer and will therefore be right, be correct in exactly 50% of the cases. Uh, whereas if you have a, a multimodal machine translation system that does take advantage of the image modality, what we hope is that it will, well, what the authors of the models could, can hope is that the model will select the correct translation um, more often than random. Um, so yeah, that's that, that's that's how it works. So what are the results of our architecture uh, as compared to others? So um, you can see at, at the top on the top of this, this is English to French. Um, the first half of the table is text only machine translation models. So as you can see uh, on standard text only uh, test sets, um, the state of the art is around uh, what is written here. So two metrics here, blue, the same as before. Comet is a better metric, uh, but blue is more used. So we provide results for both. And you see basically what the state of the art is for text only machine translation. Um, all the, 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 the first uh, green line. And of course, on commute, our uh, contrastive model that uses images, um, the, the text only model cannot have different translations depending on the image because it does not see the image. So basically it is correct in exactly 50% of the cases by definition. And, and the second half of the table is first of all, three previously published multimodal machine translation models. And finally VGA MT, which is ours. And you see, as I said in the introduction of this part, it seems that the image modality was used by uh, multimodal machine translation systems only as a regularization uh, mechanism. And this is proven by the fact that on commute, these previously supposedly better models with respect to text only models actually are not better in any way or, or, or in any shape or form. They are just exactly at 50%, which is the, uh, the score that you can expect from a model that does not exploit, that does not take advantage of image modality. Where, whereas uh, we get a uh, 72%, uh, which is much better. Same type of result. Oh, yeah. The final thing I wanted to say is that on text-only translation, as you can see, uh, we are not that bad. Basically, we mimic the state of the art of, of text-only machine translation. So basically, uh, using having the image modality available does improve the results in multiple settings. Uh, um, that's the results on commute. But if you don't have an image uh, available, then the results are not harmed. The same applies to English to German. Um, as you can see, text only 0 0.5. Preview supposedly multimodal uh, machine translation models 0 0.5, and we get 0 0.62. And this is on Czech for some unknown reason. It's a bit harder in Czech, uh, but still the same picture uh, emerges. We did a number of ablation studies. Um, so you remember that uh, during training, we train only the adapters, and but the rest of the model of the pre-trained uh, machine translation model is frozen. If it's not frozen, results are lower. Um, if we only train on multimodal machine translation objective and not with the uh, visually uh, informed mask language modeling objective, it is worse as well. Um, if we do not restrict uh, the cross-modal attention to those correspondences found by MDTR, and we have the full cross-modal attention, it is worse, um, and so on and so forth. So you can find a number of uh, ablations in the paper. If you remove MDTR features, obviously it's, it's worse. If you remove clip features, it's worse. So having the global information is, is useful, and so on and so forth. And so the conclusion of that is that we actually are able to 
we think for the first time to, to really use uh, visual features to improve uh, machine translation. And these are uh, other examples uh, of what we are able to do. And you see that most of the ticks are green. There is just one error uh, on the top right of the screen. OK, um, I'd like to conclude with a few remarks uh, on multimodality uh, um, in the age of chat GPT, basically, um, which I think is uh, the elephant in the room uh, of, of such a talk um, and of indeed any talk uh, concerning NLP these days. Um, you probably know, because a lot has been written about that, that conversational uh, generative language models uh, such as GPT and others uh, are very often quite bad when they are asked to do some reasoning. Um, and sometimes very basic reasoning, such as additions and multiplications, um, if it involves large numbers. Um, and as a result, they cannot be relied to generate information that is faithful uh, to their training data. Um, they cannot access live information. And in fact, when you think about the training data and faithfulness to training data, that is one problem. But the other problem is that they are trained on data found on the internet, so that uh, the training data uh, to which we would like them to be faithful is itself not uh, trustworthy, uh, which is another issue. And um, a, quote, simple, end quote, idea is to try and um, combine these conversational models with external sources, sources of information, both uh, databases and tools, and this is the idea behind something, for instance, uh, that's one example, uh, like Toolformer, uh, which is a uh, way to fine tune a, a large language model so that it guesses when uh, it, it would be preferable that it does not keep predicting the next most probable word, but that it uh, predicts a query to be sent to a database or to a tool to retrieve the answer uh, provided by that tool and then to consider all that as its context and then uh, resume predicting the next probable word. And this actually um, helps such models um, achieve complex tasks for which even basic reasoning is sufficient or basic database querying is sufficient to, to, to get the, the right thing uh, produced, um, but for which the default GPT-3 or chat GPT models uh, are not really able to do that. Um, and another example uh, of such um, ways to transform a model into something multimodal by accessing external tools uh, or external databases uh, is the so-called uh, are the so-called chat GPT plugins. And I will just finish the talk by showing you what it, what it means uh, using the Wolfram Alpha. Uh, plugin. Wolfram Alpha is a legacy question answering system uh, that is able to provide answers to very complex uh, questions and queries in a large number of domains. Um, this is an example of what ChatGPT um, outputs without uh, Wolfram Alpha. If you ask it, how far is it from Chicago to Tokyo? And you get an approximative incorrect, like it is not completely false, but it's not the correct answer. And if you use uh, Wolfram Alpha, it will be queried at the right moment, provide the right answer, and then you get something more complex and more complete. And you can even get a little image uh, with the map of how, how it goes to, to fly from Chicago to Tokyo. Uh, so that's a little bit of multimodality, if you like. The final example I will show you is if you ask uh, ChatGPT plus Wolfram Alpha plugin, to make a spectrogram of synthesized speech for hello there. Uh, for some unknown reason, it actually does not do that. It shows you how to do it. Uh, but if you ask it to do it, then it will create this image, which is extraordinarily multimodal because it's an image that is the illustration of, of audio, um, um, which is the equivalent of the text that was provided as an input. Um, so yes, uh, NLP beyond text, uh, what's next? And this is my conclusion slide. Um, NLP these days is evolving faster than ever. Um, the emergence 
of neural approaches has made a multimodal uh, um, work and much easier. Um, previously, NLP people, machine translation people, speech people, and vision people use completely different mathematical tools. Uh, now we use the same ones, which are therefore easier to combine. Um, yeah, I won't comment on chat GPT. Um, but like these things have been said several times. I still believe that these uh, conversational models come with a, a lot of challenges, trustworthiness, factuality, uh, com combination with other modalities. For instance, GPT-4 was announced as combining image and text, and no one has seen any demo with image for now, as far as I know. Um, this comes with a lot of, of challenges that are probably interesting to, to study in the future. And I think that multimodal NLP and multimodal studies in general um, will have something to say on, on the future of these uh, very large language models. And uh, that concludes my talk. And I'm obviously open to questions. Uh, Jean has a question. I have two questions. So one thing I didn't quite understand at the beginning, you said, if I understood correctly, that you had some representation that was really powerful, but the decoder was not powerful enough, then change decoder. But I thought that when you have an, um, an autoencoder type of thing, the representation depends on the decoder, no? Yes, it does. So it's not the representation that was powerful, it's the representation including the decoder. Um, yes, but the, the situation is not exactly uh, that of an autoencoder because you do not train a uh, laser on autoencoding, you train it on translation. Oh, so you don't use the decoder for so training? You, yeah, you do, but you do on in, in a translation uh, setting. So basically what happened, I think that the, the, way, the reason why they used a uh, simple decoder is to force the generalization to take place uh, uh, at the sentence embedding level because if you do not do that it might be the case that you will um, end up with um, um, sentence representations that will depend too much on the uh, output language and so if you want to force decoding you want to probably to force uh, like it, it would probably have worked less well in terms of language independence if the decoder was too good during mm -hmm. pre-training of the laser embeddings of uh, the laser encoders that that's what I think. Okay, I have a second question, and I'm done. The for the the thing with images, I was intrigued by the fact you said only two percent of the images, but you check by hand 29,000 yes. 29, sentences. No, a sample. Okay, and the other thing is that um, to me, when I see chips in a ball of football players, those are kind of artificial examples. So it's not. I'm, I'm very naive, and so it's 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 not surprising to me that very few of the te the text would be ambiguous because uh, most of the text is a communication device, right? So it's pretty good and not being very ambiguous, especially if you had context around the sentence. So do you really believe that it's important to add images to text in, in practice? That's a good question. And it's a question that is a recurrent question uh, on, so is it really useful to have, to be able to look at the image when translating? Is it really useful to have a look, to, to have access to the previous sentence or the previous sentences when translating? Because it's really rare that in fact they are useful. The answer is yes, you're right. It's, it's mostly not useful, but sometimes it is. And so if you want to be able to deal with these examples and these situation where it, it is necessary, then well, this is obviously a constructed example, right? This is meant to evaluate the ability of the model to actually take the visual input into account. And that's all it, that, it's not meant to be representative of anything uh, that is statistically frequent, or I'm not saying that there are some chips in a ball is, is a pr very frequent sentence in life. Uh, and even when it is uttered, probably it is always uttered in contexts where it is not ambiguous, but that's the whole point. The context is here provided in the form of images. I mean, language is often not ambiguous in context. Um, the question is, how often is context necessary to make it non-ambiguous? And the answer is generally not often. But when it is, then you have to you have to be able to take that context into account. And we have a question on the chat as well from uh, from Quentin or Quentin. Oh, we have a few. So thank you for the very nice talk. A question on the first part. How does the encoding decoding behave with named entities, proper names? Yeah, that's a very good question. 
Um, that's a very good question. The answer is, it could be worse. It is sometimes surprisingly good, actually, um, at, at handling named entities. Um, and when I say surprisingly, it's even like sometimes sentences of length, you know, trend, uh, 30 words or something like that with named entities in it. And the named entities are almost correctly uh, transcribed or translated. Um, and the way it does, like the, the type of errors that are made are not necessarily the same uh, in text to text and in speech to text settings. So, for instance, in speech to text settings, sometimes the named entities um, are, uh, are produced in text form um, with approximative pronunciation. Like if you pronounce what was produced, it sounds the same as what was actually produced or almost the same. Whereas when you, if you're in a text to text setting, sometimes the beginning is the same and not the end of it as if it was able to, but it like these, these sentence embeddings surprisingly are actually able to be quite accurate even on such difficult because largely uh, unseen words as named entities. This also came at, as a surprise to us, but it's a very good question because indeed it's one of the most difficult things for a sentence, uh, for a fixed size representation of a whole sentence um, to actually represent. He says, thank you very much. Uh, we have two other questions online actually. Um, okay. Shall we do those before going back to the room? See if there are any other questions. So we have a question from um, Bittabang. Uh, sorry if I, if I mispronounced your name. Um, what happens in the case of imbalances, say the imbalances on modes, e.g. a lot of high resource language text, English, French, and not so much English images accompanying that text? Oh, so that's about the second part. So um, in fact, the setting we place ourselves in is a setting whereby uh, for a given input sentence, you have an accompanying image. Um, and if you do not, then uh, the, the system is able to ignore it. And this is why we get these results. So in the test 2016, test 2017, and MS COCO data sets, uh, there are no images associated. Um, and so these are settings where we do not have images uh, as an input, and we are able to translate them correctly. Um, I don't know whether that answers the question. I'm not completely sure that I correctly understood it. Um, from what I understood from the question, it's maybe during training. So if you have an imbalance in data between... Oh, so... Uh, uh, I may, may not have... Okay, so if it's during it's training, then the idea is that there is an imbalance because obviously there is a lot more uh, text-only parallel data than, uh, than there is um, multimodal data. And what we do is that we pre-train a multilingual BART with the text-only parallel data. Uh, so we can take advantage of that uh, as much as possible. And then we use the uh, multimodal data to fine tune our adapters. So that's that's how we take advantage of both. Um, um, and we have a question from Biswesh. So hi, Benoit, thanks for the talk. Does the first project with laser take only one sentence at a time, both speech and text, or does it take a larger context into consideration? So that is also a very good question. Um, the architecture that I presented takes sentences one after the other uh, as an input. But the whole idea of Paul Ambroise's PhD started um, with in mind the possibility to model um, sequences of sentences in the form of sequences of sentence embeddings in the sentence embedding space and to try and understand whether the sentence embedding space has nice enough properties so that the the way sentences naturally follow one uh, one another in a natural text can be understood and represented in the sentence embedding space pretty much in the same way that uh, the language model represents how words can follow naturally one another to form a, a sentence right and to have some sort of sentence level language modeling type of thing so that was the initial idea of the PhD. Uh, and then we started playing with this cross-lingual, cross-model things and uh, cross-model translation. Um, and it worked well. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll see. I hope we will come back to, to this sentence level language modeling type of thing. Uh, but that's a very good question. Thank you, Biswash. 
Um, are there any more questions, either online or in the room? I could maybe ask one then. <laughs> so actually, um, you've spoken a bit uh, more about the, you've answered some more questions on the first. So on the second one, what other next steps? Um, for well, example, that... what challenges would you have applying it to other languages? The first or the second the part? Se uh, the second part. Well, that's a very good question. And I, I'm sure that the four supervisors plus Mathieu will have interesting meetings in the coming in the, in the coming weeks to reflect on these questions. Um, no, more seriously, I um, so I as I as I wrote here, uh, we have a new version of the corpus with more um, examples uh, to strengthen uh, our results and the statistical significance of our results. And yes, extending it to other languages uh, would be interesting. Uh, also, we are, like it looks like we have three or four languages here, but it's it's very specific. We have English as an input, and then three languages as an output, and so that's. Uh, quite a restricted uh, number of settings um but yes it is definitely the case that we want to to um to be a bit more multilingual um there are a few issues with multi uh, multilinguality in such corpora we had already to discard some of the examples we started with english to french right um and then we translated these examples to german and czech it happens that sometimes uh if you translate for instance into german the ambiguity that you had when going from English to French uh, is not there anymore because in German, both meanings use the same word anyhow. So we had to discard some, some examples for that reason. Also, um, I mean, French, German, English, and Czech are very similar languages and they are used by people, at least the examples we have with very similar cult cultures. Um, it might be the case that if you go to more different languages, um, the notion, the even the very notion of ambiguity will become a bit different. The context, the concepts will not necessarily be exactly the same, and so on and so forth. Hey, thank you very much. Um, if there are no more questions, then let's thank Benoit again, and thank you all for coming. No, thank you. And have a good afternoon, everybody.